So it's really my great pleasure now to uh, introduce Professor Barrett. I'm sure he's very well known to, uh, to many of you. And one quick look at his CV, and it becomes very clear why the university was so pleased to offer him a professorship. Mark obtained his first degree in physics and philosophy. Uh, he then went on to be a scientific officer at the Building Research Establishment before he joined the Energy Research Group at the Open University where he undertook his PhD. And that group is one of the first sort of multidisciplinary energy research groups in the UK. After his PhD, he became a research fellow at the Open University and then he joins the Earth Resources Research as a consultant. Uh, and he followed that by setting up his own consultancy company. Mark then joined UCL on a prestigious RCUK academic fellowship, which, uh, when completed, translated into a senior lectureship. Mark has undertaken research for global universities, the European Commission, central and local governments, companies and NGOs, covering a broad range of topics. His research has been published internationally in a wide range of disciplinary journals, including Renewable Energy, Studies in Conservation, Energy and Buildings, Energy Policy, Advanced Materials Research, and <coughs> The Lancet. He's very sought, heavily sought after to give invited talks all over uh, the world. Uh, he's established his own research group uh, called the Energy Space Time Group at UCL Energy Institute, and he's supervised over 11 PhD students and uh, develop new master's modules. So I'd now like to invite Professor Barrett to give his inaugural lecture. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks very much, Taj. <coughs> Particularly glad there's no heckling or questions, but professors only tell the truth, so that's all right. Um, so we're very lucky if we turn into history. And if we're really lucky, we find something we like doing. And working on energy environment with so many great people over the last 40 years has been my great and good fortune. And several of the people who I've worked with over the last years are here today and uh, makes me feel very emotional. The subject is fascinating from a technical, economic, environmental and political point of view and it's never far from the news. This probably started around uh, my last year at Sussex University, 1973, when we had Vietnam, nuclear war, <coughs> and our response as students was to band together and uh, think about going all to live together in an autonomous eco-house. But, of course, we were completely inept, so this idea of bourgeois escape was utterly beyond our capabilities. And though a poor mathematician, I somehow stumbled into becoming a modeler. <coughs> And for me, partly, I suppose, after doing philosophy of science, modelling is, is a sort of scientific method, really. And um, building models promotes understanding, I think, and can provide quantified analysis, which helps policy. One of my heroes, Richard Feynman, said, uh, <coughs> what I cannot create, I do not understand. I'm not quite as uh, ambitious as that, but what I cannot model, I do not understand. I've worked... Um, as Taj said, as a civil servant in universities and charities um, across the world, and um, with many great collaborators, who I won't list here, it would take too long. And this has been great fun, actually. And privately, um, I sometimes enjoy the delusion I'm helping to save the planet, so that's also good. About 10 or 15 years ago, I realised that uh, <coughs> a very large part of my work um, was done before the internet, before email, it was done with fax and telephone, typing up reports, black and white, on paper. And of course, to the modern generation of energy researchers, this is completely invisible. It's got nothing to do with the cyber world. And so I thought it'd be quite good to um, come and, you know, disperse some of these pearls of wisdom which were created over the time. And about that time, Taj happened to be working on a project with people in Colchester, so he came to visit me and said, come along. And um, since I've joined this asylum, I've never been so happy. <laughs> so thanks ever so much to Taj and to UCL. It's a really, truly great university, I think. So this lecture will jump about, really, as history does. 
And essentially, I, I look upon energy and environment <coughs> history, it's a sort of tragic comedy, really, where we have this veneer of rationale which actually floats on turbulent political currents, which actually really drive so much of policy uh, in this area. There's far too much to fit into the 20 or so slides which I'll show you today. And I'll warn you that my slides are always very busy, lots of information. And I was thinking about this, and actually it goes right back to primary school, where my paintings were exactly the same. <laughs> Some things don't change. So, <coughs> when I give a talk to my students, I start off with the emergence of life about four billion years ago. Um, but I don't have time to cover all that today. So I'm going to start the story about 200,000 years ago when these creatures uh, evolved on the planet. And fantastic creatures they are. They are energy systems. And they consume about 100 watts of biomass energy. They breathe in oxygen, burn the food inside, produce carbon dioxide. They have according to the Bible, 40-day energy stores. And we have adaptive envelopes to minimise energy losses and minimise water loss. And we have smart control systems to increase our energy consumption or decrease it. And one of the genders, this control is a bit smarter than the other. And this went on for a couple of hundred thousand years. And so the human population sort of bimbled along, a few tens, hundreds of millions. And then, around 1800, 16 to 1800, we discovered these giant stores of dead animals and dead plants, which we call fossil fuels. And at about the same time, not entirely because of energy, but the consumption of energy, uh, the population went up this incredibly steep curve, as did the consumption of these fossil fuels. And we're now in this short blip in human history where we have to stop burning all this stuff because it will make the planet uninhabitable. And we need to go over the edge and into a sustainable future living off renewable energy. One of the real unknowns in here is actually the population forecast. And as people uh, get richer, they have fewer children, which is quite the opposite of most of evolutionary history. One forecast for Japan was a population of 15 in the year 2300. <laughs> and at the same time, instead of 100 watts per person, we now consume about 5,000 watts per person. And what we've done, to a large degree, is we've substituted our own personal efforts and energy expenditure with this huge exom exosomatic apparatus. So instead of keeping ourselves warm, uh, burning fuel, we heat the whole space in which we live. So we've built this outer skin in which we live. Instead of walking around the place, we first of all had horses, and now we have cars. Instead of using 50 watts to travel, we use 5,000 or 10,000 watts to travel. A lot of this is incredibly wasteful, of course. Like in this room, if we all wore sweaters, we could reduce the energy consumption of this room by 10%. So rather more recent history, <coughs> we have these themes which I set out uh, of nuclear war, nuclear power, air pollution and global warming and biodiversity. And the sort of depth of red there really is an indication of how much political profile things have. So th some things like biodiversity, it built up so it's now consistently high profile. Global warming crept up the political agenda through the 80s and 90s. Nuclear power, fairly low profile, then we had Three Mile Island, up it went, and then we gradually forget about it, and then Chernobyl, up it went, gradually forget about it, and of course the latest is Fukushima. And at the same time, so we have these international things like oil crises, uh, which are before the time of most of the people in this room, um, and largely energy supply crises have been solved. At the same time we had in the UK, we had North Sea gas, miner strikes, we had cruise missiles, uh, uh, public inquiries in power stations, and various pieces of legislation, which I'll touch on later. And paralleling that, as 
Tad's la uh, laid out, so I won't go through that, is my own personal history, um, <coughs> which I have to say, to, to some extent, these crises mean there's a flow of money, <laughs> which is always good. At the same time, the UK energy mix actually didn't change very much. The main thing was um, we switched, we substituted gas for a lot of coal. That's been the main change in, uh, in trend. And here we see, that's a political blip there, it was the miners' strike of 1984-95. So again, the political power in the coal industry, for example, is one of the drivers of UK energy policy. The most important things, of course, in the end, are in having an environment in which humankind can live forever. And we have these different impacts, which last for different times. And here I've got across here the number of years to reverse impacts. And up here is the spatial extent. So if we start here, we've got air pollution, which is quite high in the news at the moment. But if you stopped air pollution today, then in, by the time the current lot of people have died off, the impacts of air pollution will be zero. If you look at acid rain, sulphur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide falling on the earth and harming plants and animals, then to reverse the impacts would take a lot longer. And then you get the very long-lived impacts, like radioactive wastes, for example, so like Chernobyl. These are regional, but not really global uh, in terms of their impact. And of course, they last indefinitely long. And now the high-profile one is global warming. We're pretty much it's a, obviously a global uh, thing, and in the end, uh, it'll have indefinitely long impacts. And finally, at the top there, you have genetic loss, which is global and permanent. So, that's a bit of history, past to the future. Here we have, um, now looking globally, and the first thing is the people are drivers of energy demand, and here we have historic population and a projection there. And the main thing to note about this is, here's the rich people, and here's Asia uh, and Africa. And that's where the whole next 100 years is going to be about those regions of the world. And because this population increase in those areas, and they're getting richer and wanting to do the same things that we do, where sulphur dioxide has gone down, nitrogen dioxide, carbon emissions, and ammonia have all gone up, driven by population growth and people becoming wealthier and copying us. So, <clears throat> we have these problems. As I say, I'm a modeler. So the sort of questions that we have are about, about this world here, and you can split the world up into an inanimate part uh, you know, rocks, sea levels, and so on. And you've got a living part, which is flora and fauna. And then within, in the human part, we have behaviour and technology. And both of these are critical to understanding energy systems and for policies um, that you can do to try and improve things. And so we build models. And these are often... We have environmental models, technology models, socio-economic models... And actually, a lot of them are mixes of aspects of all three of those. And the questions we try and answer is, will the systems that we devise, will they actually work in engineering terms? How much will they cost? What's the best design? What impacts will they have? And so the sort of computer models that I've built are for simulation and optimization, And um, they help. If you can build a good model, then it means you probably have a quite a good understanding of the system you're looking at. So this started off my first proper job, my first of two PAYE jobs that I've had in my life, uh, was at the building research establishment. And I wrote a Fortran program to simulate the operation of solar water heating systems. It was a fantastic place to work, actually. It was public at that time. Um, and I got a really good training there. I didn't quite fit into the place, though. Um, it was a thing, as you went up through the levels, you got bigger desk. And at a certain grade, you've got a picture of the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And then this directly, this Fortran program, le led directly into my PhD, called the Dynamic Physical Energy Model of the United Kingdom, which was a much longer Fortran program, and it simulated the hourly demands and supplies of conventional and renewable energy. So, plus a change. There's been no really new energy technology since nuclear power. Lithium batteries, for example, were invented 100 years ago. But, apart from nuclear, the costs of these are reduced, their efficiency and so on, and partly, contrary to, there was a book called Small is Beautiful by uh, Schumacher, small is beautiful, but actually bigger is better. So when you look at all the renewable technologies, they're bigger. Wind turbines are now, how high are they? 300 metres. Um, whereas the original ones are 200 kilo kilo kilowatts, now they're 8,000 kilowatts. And instead of little solar installations, we have solar farms now, because <coughs> they're cheaper. So here is a, from my PhD thesis, a picture of the demand for electricity across the day, and we're taking energy in and out of storage to try and balance, uh, try and balance the supply of wind and solar against demand. And here is Dynamo. This is a dynamic physical energy model. And because uh, I'm so creative, <laughs> five years ago, dynamic energy model. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in colour and it's got animations. So it's much better. But this is an example here. What you're seeing here is a winter, spring, summer and autumn day where we're starting off now as it is now. So we have nuclear and coal and we turn them on and off. Got quite a lot of solar already in the summer, of course. And then gradually, as we're going through the years, we're getting more so, uh, solar, more wind. And the problem with these is that the wind blows when the wind blows and the sun shines when the sun shines. So we have a very difficult problem of matching these supplies of energy to demand. And that's what I've spent a lot of my life looking at. So the first thing is, you can model people as well. We're energy systems. And just as you have stocks of buildings, so you have stocks of, building, uh, stocks of people. Uh, except people build themselves, of course. And one of the fundamental things that's not often talked about in energy scenarios is the number of people. So here's one projection, where in 2050, there might be 65 million people, there might be 90 million people. And obviously that makes a total difference to the amount of energy demand. This is very rarely discussed. And not only that, if you do a model, you see that the population is ageing. So the number of people of my age, particularly from the, ba uh, the baby boom, are increasing proportion uh, of the population. Uh, and actually we need support from the next generation. So. And as we get older and as we get richer, we tend to live on our own. I think it's partly, if you can afford it, why, why, why squabble at home, but you might as well live on your own. So households are getting smaller through ageing and through wealth, I think. And generally, the more people there are in a house, the less energy you use. Because you're sharing living spaces, you're sharing televisions and so on. That's what I used to think anyway, but of course now everybody has their own screen and a television. So these fundamentals of uh, what the stock of people is the fundamental driver to energy and environment. And of course we move about and we do different things. So here we have our human use of time, so sleeping here, employment, study and so on. That's eating and personal care, so that little dip there is when you're having lunch. And when we were working uh, with a project with the French, we found that the amount of time used for lunch was much, much greater, actually. <laughs> they were really, really keen on it. So the way people behave, and we're just diurnal mammals, and this hardly changes, actually, over the last 40 years, the amount of time we spend watching TV or working or sleeping. And the other thing is, of course, is weather and renewables. So when it's cold, we need more energy to heat our houses. So when you look at an energy system like a house here, you have people doing things, but also the amount of energy is needed as partly their activities, but partly also the weather outside. So you need to consider both of these things. My students always identify with this one. <laughs> Actually, so do I. 
Um, so that's people. Probably the first big energy environment area that I got into was acid rain. And um, this with uh, an NGO called the Acid Rain Secretariat, uh, a Swedish outfit. And I just got contacted with them, and I worked with them for five years before I met them. This was the age of fax and telephone and very expensive European travel. And over a period uh, of 30 years, I've been working with them, looking at acid rain, acid emission control, big power point, station, uh, point sources of air pollution, sulfur dioxide uh, across Europe, uh, and then on the health impacts of those. And one of my collaborators is Rodri there, um, who uh, worked with, and Helen actually, from Imperial College. Uh, there. Um, and so there's a long range transport of air pollution, and this program still goes on because, of course, we were the dirty old man of Europe at the time, and of course, all our pollution went to Scandinavia rather than falling on us. And then there was also a local air pollution programs, and one of the most exciting pro uh, programs I was involved with is called the Auto Oil Program, and this was designed to set the standards for diesel and uh, petrol vehicles in order to meet air quality standards in cities. And I built this model called Transopt, which optimised the whole system, and the results in part were used to set up the Euro 3 and Euro 4 standards for vehicles. Of course, I was only one of many working on this, um, but I think I played a, a, a small role in it anyway. And that went through and it, it ended up in legislation. And this is really exciting when you do something which ends up with legislation which has an impact. Of course, it hasn't been as much as we hoped because, as you know, the um, air pollution in cities is still a concern of ours. And funnily enough, one of the people uh, with Ed, my, Ed Sharp, my colleague here, we've just been working on this again uh, on our city project and uh, for Client Earth. <coughs> and that's another quite good thing. Client Earth are people who are prosecuting, or uh, DEFRA, for not coming up with good air quality plans. And this is very exciting when you get involved with, in channels which actually might have some political outcome. Around 1983, I got involved um, in the Sizewell B pub PWR Public Inquiry, which was the uh, two of the longest public inquiries in UK history. I was happily also involved with the second of those, the Terminal 5 inquiry, uh, uh, and unhappily lost both of them. And we did two projects there I got involved with. One was the Council of Protection of Rural England, uh, and again, as a friend, Hugh, I worked with on that. And that was to say, rather than investing in the PWR, invest in energy efficiency uh, uh, is, is a much better investment. And the other thing I got involved with was the GLC funded a district heating for London and I got involved with modelling the economic benefits of that on the electricity system. After two years and then of the, the inquiry and then five years after that or four years after that the inspector concluded that the PWR would be in the national interest and Sizewell began generation in 1995. Of course, you know, the economic cases of the opponents were all brought out to bear in terms of low coal prices, exchange rates and so on. A second inquiry was Hinckley, funnily enough, in 1988 and uh, shortly after that the government decided to put nuclear on hold. Now this was just shortly after Chernobyl and they couldn't privatise nuclear because funnily enough it didn't seem to be very good from an economic point of view. And also there's no acceptable waste strategy. But apparently all these problems have been solved now. Um, and so uh, new public subsidies are proposed to go ahead. One thing I will say, these public inquiries are fantastic focal points for all these people. It stimulates money to pay analysts with alternative views. Um, and it's a great shame that, for example, the Hinkley proposed Hinkley expansion isn't subject to this kind of inquiry. It also has the advantage, of course, it delays it for years. And um, modelling is not the only method. If modelling doesn't work, then you can try something else. So that's when we were prote protesting at Torness Power Station, 
which was a very funny time, and there were a lot of Buddhist monks there with us, banging their drums. <coughs> and then after the protest at Tornes, they all got on, they started walking, didn't they? To, um, to um, Fast Lane, protest to get the nuclear weapons. That was very that was funny. And now this is the most hilarious project that I've been involved with. Was um, in the early 90s, there was a statutory responsibility for local authorities to plan for nuclear attack. But they refused to give the planning basis for that. What should your plans have to cope with? This is obviously very complex. So the GLC funded a study to meet the statutory requirement to plan for nuclear war. And he's not here today, but Phil Stedman, who's a current colleague at UCL, uh, and I and several other people. And there were these tasks. One was to compile a spatial database of people in infrastructure. And we did this for every square kilometre. And in those days, you didn't have to write everything down, but, you know, there's more room on my USB stick than we had on our hard drives. So that was a real struggle. Then we took assumed uh, Soviet rocket force attack scenarios across the whole UK. Then we modelled the effect of those on people, death, infrastructure, destruction, agriculture, destruction. So basically we blew everything up and it was such fun. <laughs> it was really, really funny. We'd go and think, oh, we've got some pigs left in Norfolk. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, here comes the fallout. <laughs> it really was funny because it was so ridiculous to plan. This is one of the attack scenarios for London and everything within, <coughs> it, within these contours is just flattened. You know? And the radiation, the thermal radiation would um, kill them all within minutes. And uh, one of the guys who worked with it in Newcastle and he said... <coughs> He said, well, keep your eyes closed when the flash occurs, because then you'll be able to see what happens afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and at the same time, of course, um, this used to give me nightmares. We had cruise missiles coming in to the UK uh, from 1983 to 1992. And these things were meant to blend into the countryside. So when there's a time of tension, they'd go off into the woods. But of course what happened, all the protesters would follow them with flares and CB radios. <laughs> and so if they could do that, of course the Russians wouldn't. But thanks largely to women, I think, protesting at Greenwood Common in difficult circumstances, over all the years the missiles went. And as an example of uh, a woman there cutting the fence, she was later arraigned in court before the magistrate, and uh, <coughs> um, she said, well... I did cut the fence, but I did this to avoid, to, to prevent the greater, greater crime of genocide. So he looked over his half-moon glass, he said, well, yes, but you did cut the fence, didn't you? <laughs> Take her down. So she went to prison. Oh, yeah, and then the last thing was uh, constructing the defence plan, which I wasn't actually involved with, but the only option is going to New Zealand, really. <laughs> Then in the early, early 90s, um, there'd been very little done work, on a, uh, work done on aviation. And so the World Rider Fund for Nature uh, funded, funded uh, myself and uh, a couple of other colleagues to do these global aviation scenarios. And this was a really interesting new area I'd never thought about. Very complex, of course, planes flying all over the world. And um, we constructed these scenarios. <coughs> And the basic problem, of course, is that uh, the demand for aviation is growing at about 5% a year. So a 60% increase in 10 years. Huge, huge rate of growth. And essentially, because you can, you know, you can burn up your whole carbon quota in five hours flying for your whole year. Just five hours will do it. And so because you can burn so much so quickly and it takes such little time, there's really no limit to how much flying people can do. So the top line there was my scenario, again in black and white, um, for demand. And then you say, well, if we improve the load factor, improve the technology, we do all of those things except demand, you end up with a sort of middle curve there. If you do that, and then you halve the greater growth of demand, then you just about stabilise global warming due to aviation. So as I'll come back to later, Aviation really 
If you want to ruin your life, work on aviation, because it's insoluble. And so, um, <coughs> but I was very pleased with the effect. Here's the effect of uh, aviation research on the trend there. So you can see it's not too dissimilar from that, is it? And the problem here, here's all the other pollutants I showed you earlier, and there's aviation. And you compare that with population growth. <coughs> and you can work out if the Chinese and the Indians flew as much as the Americans do now, you multiply aviation by 20, a factor of 20. That's just uh, what happens now. So that really is pretty depressing. And then one of the things we do with energy modelling is we do these energy scenarios, which are visions of the future. And we try and construct energy system designs that meet our objectives, at least cost. So we try and come up with integrated policies, which will provide energy security, uh, manage air pollution, and manage climate change, and at the same time meet social goals, like uh, fuel poverty, for example, relief of fuel poverty. And what you find is that, uh, I don't have time to go into it now, but there are some measures, like energy efficiency and demand management and renewables, which improve all of these at the same time. And so by doing them in an integrated way, then you reduce the costs of meeting all of the targets. So one of the studies I did about 10 years ago, which I started just before I came to UCL, uh, was I did uh, these scenarios for the whole of Europe. And here we see the carbon dioxide uh, with maximum technical measures. So this is pushing insulation, renewables, everything as hard and fast as you can. But of course, um, even cars live for 15 years, power stations for 30 years, houses for 100, 200 years. And so it's quite slow to introduce these measures. If you include behaviour change, then um, you can <coughs> things could be much faster. For example, you could reduce CO2 emission of the UK by about 3% just by applying the speed limit on motorways. And in theory, you could do that very quickly, couldn't you? And for global warming, it's this whole area that's important. It's not a target in any year. And you can see that the amount of CO2 you've reduced when you include behaviour change is about 50% greater than if you just look at technologies. And here's a UK scenario <coughs> where um, oil and gas primarily are replaced with wind and solar and biomass. And here's the carbon dioxide equivalent, we call it, the global warming of these. And so we can drive down the carbon of this to almost zero. But the problem remains because aircraft, even if you've got sustainable carbon in your aviation fuel, when you burn anything at 12 kilometres where you cruise, it has a global warming impact. Even if you're burning hydrogen, it doesn't matter, because the water vapour and the NOx cause global warming. And that's why it's such a stubborn problem for aircraft. Implementation. We know solutions to most energy environment problems, but not aviation. And so, to aid development, we, we need to institutions to work with. Whoops. What happened there? Okay. Oh, dear. <coughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, um, so some of the institutions I've worked with, like NGOs, central and local governments and industry, these are people who actually force the political agenda, like NGOs do, really, really important uh, NGOs. And then central and local governments, obviously, they take policy decisions and do planning, either nationally or at the local government level. And then we have industry who actually invest in things. They invest in wind turbines, and so they're important too. And working with these people is a great education. For example, uh, thanks to Peter Franklin there, we've got a project working to provide national grid uh, with electricity demand model. And, uh, of course, you work with these people, 
Um, and you must, their control room is fantastic actually. It's a place called Winnersh, and you get, out, you get out of the station at Winnersh, and they say, we want to go to the National Grid control room. <coughs> and so the taxi driver says, do you want the secret one or the other one? <laughs> <laughs> and you go in there in the control room, and there's a screen, I don't know, 10 metres, 15 metres wide, and 10 metres high, with a whole layout of the National Grid on it. And it's like, it's like a James Bond uh, you know, scene, and you expect people to come down on lines and start shooting. <laughs> anyway, working with them, these are people who actually have to drive one of the biggest technology systems in the world, National Grid, uh, from minute to minute and hour to hour. And, of course, they've got nowhere to hide. And it's really fascinating working with them. And um, we, we help them try and say, what's the impact of solar PV? What's the impact of wind? What's the impact of heat pumps on your system? How will it change uh, peak demand and variations in demand and so on? And we sold a similar model to Western Power Distribution. And then finally, which I'll say a little bit more about now, <coughs> we um, developed a city energy and environment model. And this was uh, like these previous projects with the Energy Saving Trust. Uh, again, uh, 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 proposed partly by uh, Peter, uh, EST and, and ourselves at UCL. And city population will grow by about 2.25 billion by 2050 in Asia and Africa, mainly. The population is quite stable. Huge, huge migration of people. Uh, the biggest and the fastest that we'll have ever have seen. And of course, in cities, they're fantastic in many ways, but they do have pollution problems. And they also have the problems in that cities are energy sinks, they're resource sinks. So you have to import all this energy from the outside into the city. So um, we came up with this proposal to innovate, to build a design tool here, which is the actual model and database, to go into a city energy planning forum where these stakeholders could sit around and say, well, what if we insulated the houses? What if we had more electric vehicles? What if we had district heating? And the objective of this design tool called SISEDS was to say, well, if you insulate the houses, your peak electricity demand will go like this, um, your heat demand and therefore your gas demand will go down and so on. And then to look at city supply options like district heating and solar and look at the costs of those, pollution emission and concentration and the health impacts. And this model is being used currently in Birmingham and Exeter in a sort of development phase and then we hope uh, many other cities will use it. Um, so it's a sort of run into the end now. Um, there's a lot of optimization going goes on which is trying to minimize the costs and quantifiable things. But actually, qualitative aspects of supply options are probably more important uh, than uh, the quantifiable aspects, to some degree anyway. So if you look at the political uh, controversy about nuclear power, shale gas, carbon sequestration, this isn't really done on cost basis. It's done more on uh, qualitative uh, aspects. Because partly you can't quantify everything. Um, and so here we have, I won't go through this table, we don't have time, but you can look at the different options like renewables here, uh, nuclear and fossil carbon sequestration, and you, I've given them subjective marks according to these criteria here. So surprise, surprise, you might say, these uh, hydro, bioways, solar and wind score very highly from all of these aspects. They're low regret, reversible technologies. If you don't want them anymore, or well, the next generation comes up with something better, you take them down and you don't know they're ever there. In contrast, over here, nuclear, once you start up a nuclear power station, you're committed for <coughs> tens, hundreds, thousands of years to particular waste streams. And because of the risks of some of the technologies, uh, they have political impacts. They're secret, really. But there are things you can quantify, and so for particularly for the mass-produced technologies, we have a very rapid development cycle, like wind turbines, solar PV. The cost for 
incredibly fast because you have such a fast product cycle. So here we have wind, and it's difficult to get global figures, but roughly speaking, over the last over 30 years, there's a 75% reduction in cost. Partly because you've gone from 200 kilowatts to 8,000 kilowatts. And it's just economies of scale, big as beautiful. With solar, it's the same, even faster, roughly a 90% reduction in costs, driven partly by, I think probably mainly by, mass production. So we've now got giant factories churning these things out, so the unit costs go down and down. Conversely, and it's very difficult to find out the costs, <coughs> the nuclear costs are going up. Well, how can that be? And actually, it's the penalty, I think, for learning about a dangerous technology, a complex, dangerous technology. So here we have the European power reactor. And because the product cycle for a nuclear power station is, let's say, 10 or 15 years or 20 years, you try design, see how it works, then you design something better. You're talking decades. And then something will turn up, as happened at Fukushima, as happened at Chernobyl and at Three Mile Island. So if um, I'm just now going to go into the last uh, aspects of system design. So these are the kinds of things you have to think about when you have lots of renewable energy. So the first thing you have to think about, this is winter, spring, summer and autumn, five days, is the variation in weather, in the wind and the sun and the ambient temperature and so on. Because these affect both demand and renewables, and they're correlated. So in the winter, low temperatures, because there's not much sun, so high demand. So solar energy, not much good for meeting winter demands. Conversely, wind, quite a lot in the winter, not as much in the summer. And we see here, there's five days per season, so we see here's space heating, and then it falls as you go to the summer, and then you get some air conditioning coming in there, and then as the temperature falls, you're going into autumn. And here's your supplies of renewable energy. The light blue is wind, um, and, well, the, the purple is supplementary uh, energy through trade and so forth. Sometimes you have too much energy, so you either export it or store it. Sometimes you have too little, so you take the energy out of store or you import. And here are storage levels. So it's a bit bewildering, this kind of thing, but this is the kind of thing you need to model if you're to, to try and match high renewable energy to demands. And think, oh, OK. Um, obviously, you've got a lot of variation in one country, but if, if, if the wind isn't blowing in down here on the west coast of the UK, perhaps it's blowing in Russia, or perhaps it's blowing in Greece, or down in Spain. And so, and also, when you have a high demand here, you may have a low demand here, or a lower demand there, partly because of the time differences you go east-west. And so, to try and match your demands and supplies, the further you extend your transmission grid across these regions, the more you average out demands, and the more you average out your renewables. And this actually is a picture um, from a study I did in 1988, not with renewables in it, but looking at trade across Europe. And the project we have at the moment is to try and um, answer this question, what is the best balance between storage, transmission and trade? And the great thing about sometimes you'll be exporting this way, sometimes that way. And the great thing about it is that rather than having these areas of the world like the Middle East or gas in Russia, where you have a one-way flow of energy, here you have mutual inter inter interdependence. And this means you're mutually reliant, and so it's very good for peace, I think, and political cooperation. I should say this transmission network was built uh, long before renewables targets, and it actually goes down into Morocco, down here. So for economic reasons, this transmission grid was built long, long ago. 
and the first international link was built over 100 years ago now. So this is actually just more of the same. So perhaps we should look forward to a global electric future. Here we have uh, the distribution of uh, population across the planet. Uh, obviously, th this is a bit old, but as I say, roughly 40% of the world's people live in that region there. And um, that, in the end, as they become richer, the energy demand will more and more follow what the population is. So here we have a picture now <coughs> taken from space of lighting. And of course, USA, Europe is lit up like a Christmas tree. When this picture was taken, India and China, quite dark. I should think they're a lot brighter now. This is probably 15 years old, this picture. And because the Earth is turning like that with diurnal mammals, then the pattern of energy demand for the world will follow when people get up. So this big bulge here, that's when India and China get up in the morning, start doing things, and then they go to bed. So global energy demand falls and then rises again. So we'll have this regular global pattern of energy demand. <laughs> And of course, solar energy and to a lesser extent wind follow this diurnal pattern. So I thought I'd be very clever, join up the dots. So here's my global transmission grid. And I thought I was being quite original there. But this was first thought of in 1938 by Buckminster Fuller. <laughs> and he drew a map of it with his own unique style of maps. Fantastic map, actually. And so we have a grid here, we have a grid here, we have grids in India, we have a uh, very rapidly uh, developing Chinese grid, we have a, a Russian grid stretching right across there. So actually, just by joining up these major systems, we go across the Bering Straits, a couple of hundred miles, um, this is a couple of hundred miles there to Greenland, Iceland, that's about a thousand kilometres, I think, there. Uh, but it's really not too much to extend this around the world. Whether it's worthwhile economically or technically, of course, is another question. And this is uh, maybe before I become Gaga, we'll come up with a picture of that. But uh, with Ed Sharp uh, at the moment, we're, we're looking at a, a high-resolution spatial temporal model of the European grid. Uh, but we have ambitions. Um, Possibly while we're here, one thing I thought of, there is a Trans-Asian Railway here. And so maybe high-speed rail links could follow similar pathways. And of course, railways you can connect to wind turbines and solar PV. <coughs> there was a uh, freight train. A lot of freight comes from China already into Europe, across the inland routes um, here. Um, and I think a freight train came all the way from China to London. I think it I can't remember how long it took. So again, the uh, foundations of that are there. So um, this is nearly the last slide. So we have known solutions, and 100% renewable energy can supply any foreseeable demands in buildings, industry, land, and sea transport. I'm slightly pessimistic about energy efficiency now. The last government program called Green Deal um, to give people loans uh, for insulating their buildings. Uh, it was going to do the whole stock in uh, two million years. <laughs> so, a bit too slow. Things to avoid. I think uh, nuclear is expensive, risky, irreversible. An incident in a nuclear power station anywhere in the world has a global impact. With Chernobyl and so on. And even Chernobyl, 1,500 kilometres away, it, re it limited, it restricted sheep farming in Wales for 25 years, all that distance away. The thought of size well or somewhere like that going up and uh, evacuating London is beyond comprehension. And fossil carbon sequestration is also promoted as a way to carry on using fossil fuels, but actually it's insufficient for getting anywhere near zero carbon, uh, apart from the risks that it has. So the outstanding problems, I think, is that I have no solutions to is growth in stratospheric jet travel. 
incompatible with climate change mitigation targets. And even if you started flying lower and using biofuels and turboprop aircraft, where do you get the fuel from? And bio biomass energy has very complex impacts, interactions with food supply and so on, and may be insufficient for aviation. So there's a problem to work on. I haven't mentioned, mentioned um, oops, genetics. So there's a nice storybook here called Last Fall, which you might like to read. And this is about genetics, but it's got no modelling in it. <laughs> and you can pick that up from Amazon. So that's the end. Um, history isn't cyclical. UK wind, when I last visited National Grid in their control room, there was more wind generation than from nuclear. And recently, solar energy provided 25% of demand was met by solar energy. So the demand net of solar energy was higher at the night than the day. So it's happening now. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Well, at this stage of proceedings, it's traditional for somebody to respond uh, to the lecture, the wonderful lecture that we've just heard, it's my pleasure to make that response. Um, Mark and I first met in 77, just for the younger members of the audience, that's 1977, <laughs> uh, at the Open University of the Research Group, where uh, I arrived fresh out of uh, an undergraduate course uh, to uh, do a PhD and discovered Mark, uh, already there, who it appeared had already had two um, uh, careers, um, uh, teaching and uh, researching at BRE, and I, I, was, I was incredibly impressed. Um, uh, I ended up working on wind, which was extremely interesting. Um, I wasn't particularly good at it, but there we go. Um, and uh, Mark was indeed working on diphema, uh, which I found absolutely fascinating, a fascinating piece of work. Um, and so, our paths diverged in 1984. Um, I went off to Sheffield, and uh, Mark, I think about the same time, went off into consulting. And uh, we didn't work it, uh, together again until, uh, we didn't come together again until 2006, when we both rolled up here at referred to it as the assignment. <laughs> yes, that's right, yes. Um, I, I uh, sometimes uh, tell our students that we have to keep them here until they're safe to let out. Um, uh, yeah. um, so, uh, the transition from uh, self-employed consultancy to uh, uh, academia was something that uh, you handled with a plot, if I may. Uh, and to be able to make that transition in both directions, I think, is, um, is uh, quite important. Um, when you joined us, uh, UCL Energy didn't exist, and it really only became possible to think about doing something on this scale because you you joined us, and um, we did modelling um, uh, before. 2006, but it was modeling buildings. It was it was energy plus, and probably precursors to energy plus. I can't remember all the names now. Um, so you made it possible for us to explore the interrelationships between buildings and the whole energy system, and I think that was a major step forward for us, and made it possible to think about setting up an energy institute with a much larger agenda than had been possible. Um, and I don't think it's possible to underestimate the impact that you had on the founding uh, uh, that you had beyond that. So once we set up uh, uh, the Energy Institute, I think one of the first things that you did was to uh, play a pivotal role in winning the funding for low carbon shipping. It was one of the first, I think it was the first major piece of uh, research in that area to have been undertaken in the UK. The, that resulted uh, in the establishment of a shipping group, which is now a world-leading group uh, 
talking about by Tristan Smith, who I think may be here somewhere. No, nope, I can't see him. But uh, he's probably out of the country at some meeting somewhere. That would be the explanation. But uh, that takes me a little bit off the topic. Um, if I may return just for a few, just for a couple of minutes to the lecture that you have just heard. Uh, I think it demonstrates, once again, and I've seen many <coughs> talks and many lectures by Mark, uh, that he is a, a master of both the art and the science of modelling. And that's a very interesting thing to have achieved, combining judgment, experience, and deep knowledge of the underlying engineering systems, together with an artist's sense of the appropriate balance between complexity, economy, and transparency, which provide shafts of insight into problems that are critical to the unavoidable transition that we now need to make out of the fossil fuel revolution. So, uh, it's my pleasure to give you Professor Mark Hart. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you.